This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jacinta Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer for the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the, of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to our panel discussion, Birkin Indy Speak, What is the Future of Aboriginal Education? And I would like to take this opportunity to warmly welcome the Birkin Indy and to thank you um, for joining us to share your knowledge and insights with us all. Thank you. I would also like to thank Professor Irene Watson and Colleen Clark for your incredible work in making this panel discussion possible tonight. So thank you both. Tonight we are also live streaming to an enthusiastic audience at our UniSA Mount Gambier campus, so I'm going to do a little hi, warm welcome to you all, and thank you Mount Gambier for joining us as well. And we are also recording this event, and a video will be available on our Hawke Centre website next week. So please encourage your friends and family to view this video. Um, we actually, I have to let you know, we had 200 people wanting to attend tonight on our wait list who couldn't make it with join us tonight because of capacity um, restrictions. And also quite a number of people interstate and overseas who've requested this video once it's available. So a lot of interest in this topic um, and event tonight. So well done. And it is now my pleasure to welcome Uncle Lewis O'Brien, who will provide the welcome to country. Thank you, Uncle Lewis. Maruichanga, Kana Mian and I Wangani, Mani Nabundigani Adana, Nibirako, Mankalakala, Tandanya, Mianaku, Nature Yungandalia, Nature Yakandalia, Padni Adlu Wadu. On behalf of the Ghana people, I welcome you all to Ghana country, and I do this as ambassador of the Adelaide Plains people, my brothers, my sisters, let's walk together in harmony, Natalia. There was a little girl drawing in the classroom, and the teacher went up to her and said, what are you drawing, dear? And she said, I'm drawing a picture of God. Oh, oh dear, 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 we don't know what God looks like. She said, you will in a minute. <laughs> So thank you, Uncle Lewis, and um, for your welcome to country, and also thank you and acknowledgement for his long leadership in Aboriginal education. It's, um, the, the work is um, acknowledged and appreciated. The focus for our discussion with Aboriginal elders and leaders in education is to consider what is the future of Aboriginal education. So I welcome you to our forum, and I also acknowledge the lands of First Nations peoples across the continent of what we now call Australia, and the many challenges that we meet in the education of our current and future generations. First Nations of Australia are the oldest peoples on earth, and our lives are founded on ancient knowledge systems, which continues to this day and are passed on to future generations. First Nations, as a matter of survival, live in two worlds, the Aboriginal and the Western world, which has colonised much of Aboriginal lives and lands. We ask the question tonight, what is the future of Aboriginal education in this challenging space, which has colonised much of Aboriginal lives and our lands? So hopefully, in asking this question, I hope that we're compelled to take action. Our discussion is supported by UniSA's commitment to strengthening relationships with Aboriginal peoples, and in particular relationships which are inclusive of our elders. Uncle Lewis has applied Perkininti, the Gauna word, as the name for our UniSA elders in residence group. Perkininti have described education as a change maker, 
a key to open doors and provide better opportunities, but for the opportunities to be realised, it is essential there be a two-way process to Aboriginal education, and one that is inclusive of Aboriginal knowledges. I acknowledge the Hawke Centre for this collaborative event and thank you for your work and effort in bringing tonight to fruition. I acknowledge the leadership and support of our Vice-Chancellor, Professor David Lloyd, and um, University of South Australia's Senior Management and Council for enabling the important work of strengthening relationships with Aboriginal peoples, and in particular, which are inclusive of our elders. I acknowledge the many UniSA staff, community members, and students who have supported our work, our work at the Aboriginal Leadership and Strategy um, Office, to which I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor. Uh, again, and to note our, our team who have put in considerable effort at ALS, Colin Clark, Trish Raymer, and also Jess Ford um, in the past, who have, um, uh, have worked up this event. Your work is much appreciated. I want to thank and acknowledge in particular and especially our panel of elders and also uh, Professor, my colleague, Professor Irabina Rigney, for making this event possible. So I thank you all. I want to move on now to introduce um, our special panel, Uncle Lewis, who probably everybody knows, but I will again um, remind us all of Uncle Lewis, who's a senior Ghana elder educator, advisor, and mentor, writer, and speaker of the Ghana language. He is an adjunct research uh, fellow at the University of South Australia and is widely regarded as a leader and custodian of Ghana culture. He is the recipient of many awards, too many um, to mention, but, uh, and also Uncle Lewis is well known for his leadership in education, philosophical discussions on Ghana culture, and his work on Ghana language recovery. I'd also like to um, introduce uh, Auntie Lynette Crocker, a Nunki Burka, senior Ghana woman who is passionate for community development, volunteers and advisors on education, natural resources, conservation, cultural heritage law, and health, to name a few of her ongoing work, um, work interests and concerns and has a particular concern for the well-being of our Mother Earth and her people, whilst her focus is on the truth-telling of the history of our space and place and our position in the universe. Uncle um, Kim Krapinuri, um, also joining us on the panel, is a Ngavanjiri man who was born at Point Maclay Mission, and as a child he lived with his uncle David Unipan, and is currently working on an autobiography about his uncle. Uncle Kim's extensive knowledge of Ngurundjeri culture was learned from an early age, learned from sitting quietly and listening to his elders. He is currently an artist, has been uh, painting for more than 40 years, having learned to paint in, the, um, in a boy's home in the 1960s. His artwork is often um, depicts his country, the Koorong, and its flora and fauna. Uncle David Rathman is an Aranda man, born and raised in Port Augusta, and has worked as a distinguished public servant for more than 38 years. Today, he continues to work as a consultant in Aboriginal education, community development and management, cultural studies, and communication. He continues to serve the Aboriginal community in South Australia as a member of both the Aboriginal Legal Rights Movement Board and the Board of the South Australian Museum. Uncle Frank Wanganeen is a Ghana Narunga man born at Wallaroo on the York Peninsula and was raised on Point Pierce Mission. He has lived in Adelaide for most of his life. Uncle Frank has been a committee member for many organisations and has worked in the areas of reconciliation, local government, Aboriginal heritage, native title, social justice, and the revival of Ghana language. He is a cultural educator, creating awareness of Ghana culture and Aboriginal issues. Annie Rosalind Weetra herself was born in Alice Springs and is a Narunga, Nadjuri, Eastern Aranda, and Ghana woman. Early life was lived at Pine Point on the York Peninsula, and she later moved to Port Adelaide. 
She has worked with state and Commonwealth departments and Aboriginal organisations, has served a term as an ATSIC commissioner and has worked on Aboriginal heritage and languages, Gauna and Nyiradjuri, and is committed to cancer research, community health, being, um, being an elder on the Nunga court and a visitor to Aboriginal prisoners. Uh, my colleague, Professor um, Irabina Rigney, is a professor here at University of South Australia in education. He has worked in Aboriginal education for more than 20 years and has served on the First Peoples Education Advi Advisory Group that vi advises on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander early childhood and school education. He has been a member of numerous education advisory groups, including the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, COAG, Scientific Reference Group, and the Australian Curriculum and Assessment Reporting Authority, a National Languages Curriculum Reference Group. So you can see tonight's um, panel is, um, covers um, uh, not only many generations, but many layers and, and areas and connections and relationships to um, um, Aboriginal communities um, locally, but also um, uh, joining with, with many of our nations um, further afield. It's a great pleasure for me to um, be working closely with, um, with the Elders Group. It's been an honour and um, it's been a lot of fun, actually, in the yarns that we've had. And so for you tonight, I think, the, this group brings a gift, and, and that gift is, is to try and emulate some of the work we've been doing and to share and extend upon the, the, the fabulous yarns that we've had, not only fabulous yarns for having a good yarn, but really important, significant um, work and thinking. So uh, it's a great honour for me to um, um, introduce the panel tonight. So before we begin our discussion, we're going to uh, view a short film clip that uh, um, we discussed at our elders group, and, and Annie Roslin um, remembered it because she had a, a particular connection to it and reminded us also of um, uh, Lester Irabina's connection to that film. And it was a show that was, I don't know if you can remember the Channel Niners show. I don't know, I don't watch TV. The, the, the <laughs> So is it still going? But the Channel Niners show um, did a program on, a very special program on the Woodville High School cultural performance that was in 1980. So it's a, it's a bit of local history and it, it shows um, that much of, mu much of the work that our young people are doing today had a history and there's always a history and a connection and uh, we thought it was important to make that connection back to the present for our thinking about how we move forward into the future. So thank you, we'll, we'll, we'll um, have a, it's, a, it's a very short film that we'll share with you. A witch doctor calling a spirit. There is a sick member who is in need of help. The witch doctor asked the spirit if he can heal the sick person. This dance is the contact of the witch doctor with the spirit. Thank you. 
So some local history of the past relevant to now and to our discussion tonight about the future of Aboriginal education. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge um, uh, Andrew Lindsay, Joe Brown and Gordy Wanganeen, uh, three other um, um, members of that dance group that, that joined Irabina. There's a special prize for the end of the evening if anyone can, um, can, can guess uh, uh, um, who, um, who the dancers were, and in particular, I won't name who was um, leading the charge, so. <laughs> Joke, I'm joking, there's no prize, just in case I... Um. So, at a local level, Aboriginal peoples have been actively engaged in the advancement of um, Aboriginal education for, for some time. However, Australia is the only Western colonised country that has very few independent First Nations education systems. And I want to um, point to the um, Article 14 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of, um, First Na of Indigenous Peoples, which refers to Indigenous um, education in the following way. That um, people have the right to establish and control our own educational systems and institutions to provide education in our own languages, in a manner that is culturally appropriate in its teaching and learning practices. That individuals, particularly children, have the right to all levels and forms of education um, that are offered by the state without discrimination. That states shall, in conjunction with Indigenous people, take effective measures in order for Indigenous individuals, particularly children, including those living um, outside of their communities to have access wherever possible to an education in their culture and provided in their own language. So these are minimum standards that are outlined in the um, UN Declaration um, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So we're living in a space where these minimum standards have not been taken up by the state or Commonwealth governments and our elders group um, has discussed a number of concerns and themes which are important to this question of education and its future. And I just wanna briefly, ju just to give you and highlight some of, some of the thinking and work of, of the group and the discussions that we've had. And, and I'll draw upon quotes from, from the elders group. On the topic of criminalization, and I quote from our members, if you don't go to school, you get locked up. The criminal justice system has treated us badly, has damaged us. And I quote, South Australia has one of the worst records for dealing with kids and locking them up. On Aboriginal culture, um, cultural identity is essential knowledge for Aboriginal children's success. Upbringing around old people is important. Repetition, same stories over and over. Planting key things in their mind is like planting seeds. Aboriginal culture is powerful. These old people are affecting and teaching you. They told me this country is all our university. Even in our old age, we are being taught things. Education doesn't stop, it goes on forever. We need to capture that we are the original people, otherwise, who are we? We need to know about our origins, the dance and stories, it gives us pride. On the question of how do we educate effectively, and I quote from the group, time, we need time to look at Aboriginal methods of teaching, maths and English alongside culture, identity, country, we need to walk and talk it. We need thinking time, more time to digest two different cultures with different thinking. We learn by experience and by doing it. What are the blocks to education? While we have 500 or more Aboriginal students at UniSA, 300 enrolled at Flinders and 300 at Adelaide University, the problem remains for all of the others that get left behind. So that is a worry and that has been a concern. We should have more of our own Aboriginal schools, but the mainstream takes, takes them over. They give successful programs the chop. It's not the successful kids we need to worry about. 
It's the kids who can't read and write. On thinking about truth telling, what are the barriers to both the telling and the listening? Our truth hasn't been told in our voice, it needs to come from us. The state education system is built on racism. They should get rid of the fake history, can't keep that going into the 21st century. And finally, we are successful. We need to make a point of it, a statement. The positive part is we have succeeded. And on that note, I want to um, ask Uncle Lewis to, um, um, to lead our discussion tonight. I think Irene just raised a question. I, I was uh, asked by an Aboriginal man in 1977 to go around to visit the kids in school. He said, because you've been through secondary school, he said, because I went to a Lefevre Tech. And he said, would you go and help the kids? Well, I got a surprise in 1977 how many kids we had in year 12. We only had nine. And because uh, we weren't allowed to go to school and there's, and the reason for that is because when you look at our history, we were a highly educated society. Even Dr. Penny wrote a little booklet for the Advancement League, Aboriginal Society and Educated Society. And I'll give you a couple of examples to, to me, it always sticks in my mind, that Maria Locke topped the exams in New South Wales in 1811. My great-great-grandmother went to school to get first to marry here in 1848. And Governor Rowe wanted to make an example, so he said, I want you to learn domestics and read and write in English. Well, she learned to read and write in English in three months, and she taught her husband to read and write, and he came from England. And so you see these contradictions, and then the two lads from Western Australia, they went to Rome and become Benedictine monks. And they were 10 and 7. And the seven-year-old boy won silver medal in Rome for Latin. And it, sadly, he died in Rome and was buried at the monk's gate at the entrance to Rome. And so you can see the educational standard was fairly high. And I knew that as a boy growing up on the mission because I, when I talked to the old people and the things they said, I thought, wow. You see, a lot of people don't even know the history of the country about our development in, in education. Our people here, we're educators. We have a lot of word that are about education. We can say things like Yerubala Luka, which is four times. We know the concept of times. We know Yerikatata, that's at, at random. And then we have these fancy words for thinking, like Yara, expressing the notions of individuality, reciprocity, twice, both, one another, difference. It's about two things. And uh, we taught the rest of the, all the different groups in this country. We ran conferences. We have a word for conference, bum 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 The German missionaries wrote it down. They knew that. So this, we know about education. And when we watch what our kids have to go through at school, when I've seen what they had to go through, it's, it's not pleasant. I went through some of them myself. Because it's disjointed what we're doing. And it, I think that I hear educators all around the world say about our education now, it's not right. Because everyone knows it's not right. Because the thing is, people don't know the difference. And the difference is this. Any society will produce the products they need to run their country because a 30% at the top will educate themselves. Just give them the books and they'll do it. I could do that myself when I went to school. It's no problem at all. But we're not worried about that. It's the 70% that are left behind that don't know how to lead, read and write. And this is the problem in most of the countries in the world. And that's why you get in trouble with all these things that are happening today. And everyone thinks that's good over dogs, but it's not. It's the 21st century and everyone's entitled to an education and we should raise the standards for everyone. We can't get them all up the top, but it's not the point. You've got to get to them where they can manage their own affairs. They've got to be able to read and write when they leave school. That's a must. But you count how many people leaving school today that can't read and write, and it's a sadness. And I found that from an Aboriginal bloke. So we named the parklands in Adelaide. And people said, why do you want to put names on them? Well, I said, it's better than numbers. Because the 29 parks in Adelaide, there's only nine had names. And so we gave 20 parks names at their first time in their life. And when you think, why do they number the parks? Because they found that in the time of downturn, you employ people and you get them to work in parklands, cutting lawns and all that. And it's easier to send illiterate people to park one. And that's the sadness when you see that. 
that's always in the country. And then you think, that's a sad story to hear that. And that's what we're on about here. It's not about we don't produce the goodies, because the goodies will always be there. That's in every society. They'll always produce clever people because they'll take care of their own education. It's as simple as that, because even the, uh, the, um, the Catholic Church ran education, and that was the, um, oh, I forget their names now, but anyway, look what they did, which was rather sensible. You have the best teachers with the worst kids. You don't put the best teacher with the best kids because they don't need you. They just need guidance, there's the books over there, a little bit of mentoring, and away they'll go. And so this is what we're talking about, this double standard, which is not good, because you have to educate people to a reasonable level in the 21st century, because it's all over the world, we're all worried about it, and so I think it's about time of change. It's like Bob Dylan said, the winds are blowing again, and there's a time of change, and accepting some of these things are not right, because I talked to Fraser Mustard, and he, he said, you shouldn't be having childcare, it should be child development, because even our people could do that. You could pick, you look at some of the stories written about Aboriginal people with children. It's far more advanced than modern society does, because I can tell you this, I saw a documentary, it even surprised me. Aboriginal women were teaching six months old baby cardinal points. So they're saying, kuchu kuchu ku, they said, nakandi mari, look east, and the kid will pick himself up and look east. And so you can see you've got to teach your kids a lot more in a very young age because that's when their minds are highly developed because a kid at their maximum at three years of age, so you've got to give them some things to hang their hat on. Not let them play little funny games when they go to school. That's, and, then this, and then they do this quantum leap when they get to grade three. And that, our kids show up and that. When you get to grade three, whoa, I've got to be disciplined. I've got to know about math. I've got to do all these other things. And you've got to do a jump. Well, it's too big a jump. You should be able to do a graduation, where it's developmental steps, pro progressing at interim steps that make sense to a kid. Because you're teaching them in the beginning, it's fun and games. And it shouldn't be. It should be real life experience and development. And so this is the things we've got to change in schooling. And we've got to be realistic and, and be honest about these sort of things. It's not doing it right. And then you teach kids in primary to be disciplined, sit in order and listen to the teacher and don't say a word. And you squash your imagination. Look at that story I told you earlier about that girl painting. Well, look at her spirit. You will in a minute. She's, she's, she's free in life, but what the schools will knock that out of her. I'll say, don't do that. Don't do things you can't do. Don't, we don't know what he looks like. Restrict kids. And if you don't restrict them, you let them develop at their own pace. And another thing I could tell you this, when I was a three-year-old boy, I found I was very lucky in life to have some of these real-life experiences and what they meant and what it was about. My grandmother sat me on a log when I was three years old and told me a story. And like all kids halfway through, I asked a question. And she said, tut-tut, and left me off the, when I walked away, and left me on the log. Well, I had to do a lot of thinking. I didn't have the words for it, but you can do your own mental thinking. You can say, why does my grandmother leave me? Why, what have I done wrong? Well, what she says, you shouldn't talk. You should listen. And we have a beautiful word in Ghana for listening, Yuri and Ganendi, wiring with the ears, deep listening. And that's what you know is it becomes accelerated learning. There's too much questioning in school by kids. Kids shouldn't be questioning because people don't know the other side of it. I saw it when I went to school, I saw the kids playing the games. Kids will work out a game to play, and what they'll do, they'll play a game with you, and they'll say, They'll memorise the words, and then when you ask them to read the sentence on the board, they've remembered it, but they don't read it. And so you can see that questioning gives quick, easy answers, makes kids lazy. And people don't even question that. They don't even see it. Because kids will be smart, but smartness is not the answer. It's intelligence and seeing that you're doing the wrong thing and you've got to stop them. You've got to make them listen, and you've got to make them do the things. You've got to test them. Everyone gets afraid of testing. I used to get every, tested every day when I was on the mission, and I, there was nothing wrong with it. It becomes the norm then. But everyone gets, oh, don't upset the kid. Oh, we've got to treat him pleasantly. Well, you can't do these sort of things. You've got to be disciplined and ordered and get people to develop themselves to a workable level. Anyway, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> education if you like to uh, say that. Um, I went to country schools, I uh, went to uh, the schools in Taparu, suburb schools, but it was always good to have the, my other siblings with me. 
uh, they gave me the confidence. I, and I happened to like learning. Some of my siblings didn't like actual learning. They wanted to do their own thing. Um, why I'm saying that is that when I became a mother then, I had my own three children in a, a suburb at Pennington at, in primary school. And they sort of uh, reminded me of myself and my siblings. They didn't want to go to school. I said, you have to go to school. You have to go to school. Being a single mum, you had to send your children to school. So what I did, I went to school myself with them and got involved in the school. Uh, talked to the principal, to the ART teacher, to, uh, we had an Aboriginal education worker there, Pam. Uh, so we all started talking together and saying, well, these are the problems I could see from my point of view, from a mother's point of view. And uh, then the principal, he was a, such a, a sweet person, genuine, loveliest person you could ever meet in the school. We were lucky, uh, our principal there. And he showed, showed us uh, what was needed from his point of view, and we showed him what was needed from our point of view. So we got together. And out of that, I got some other parents involved who were having to, who children attended there. And um, we developed, we got a, a parent group going. We had a couple of the uh, men, fathers, as well as the mums, young, some young mums, some older mums. And then it was just, um, we all got together and through NAIDOC week, we had the biggest involvement from the, the school, the staff, all the children from all the grades, all did uh, Aboriginal art, and uh, we did, uh, we got a, uh, this is a good story, we got a wombat sent from Sejuna, and the lady was uh, uh, related uh, to the Sejuna mob over there, West Coast mob, and she uh, got it sent over, it was cooked and frozen, she got it sent over on the bus. <laughs> So it came over, and by the time it got to us, it was ready. We made a hole in the ground like a hungy, put it in there overnight. We had some of the kids doing, like, making sure everything was all right for it. No one would take it in the middle of the night. And then uh, our family cooked the damper, and some other people provided the other salad. So it was a combination of, of everyone coming together uh, as a group to uh, celebrate our cultural day, which was NAIDOC Day. And we even had an Aboriginal band there by the name of Coloured Stone. And uh, I tell you, it was one of the best days that our children, the other children, the parents, uh, the principal had at that school. And it was so enjoyable, no one wanted to go home because it was so good. We had the music, people were able to eat our traditional food. And to me, that showed that the more you become involved in a primary school or a high school, as some people, like Lester was involved in the high school <laughs> as a student, um, the more you become involved as a parent, I come from the parent uh, perspective here, um, is that the better off your children will be, or a you know, dad or a mum. I see we've got a young parents here with their children. If, that's an observation I could make, is that right? You brought your children with you? Good on you. And that's the way to bring your kids along and get them involved, but go where they go. Go to the schools, because that's where they need you. Some kids don't need you. My kids needed me, and that's where I went. And we, we did that for th three years running. We had different um, activities through the, the next night of week. We had a, a big arts display uh, down at Port Adelaide. And uh, that went off really well. There was lots of parent involvement by then, lots of community involvement from other people. And, uh, and even the other school, there was another school across the way that came over to learn from us. How did we do it? Simple, you get involved. You go there and you talk up for what you believe in as an Aboriginal parent and what should be happening in the school so that your children can succeed and do well and enjoy it. Education should be about enjoying, learning, not just to, like, uh, as uh, Uncle Lewis pointed out, you've got to sit there and just take everything 
what the teacher tell you. Sometimes you might not agree with that. Even as a young person, you might say, no, mum did it this way, or dad showed me that way, or in our case, it was papa or nana said that we have to do it this way. That's the Aboriginal cultural learning that comes from the home. It's not that acceptable in the schools. You have to be um, conditioned, for, for what other better word, I don't know, in school, in the system. And it goes from primary school right up to high school and hopefully, and probably in the universities. But there, you, you, you're an adult, but when you're a child, you just want to uh, be able to succeed and fit in with everybody else and to, you know, get the good results in school. That was just one of the things, uh, as an Aboriginal parent, that I did and I found that so successful uh, and uh, to create our involvement in the school, but you have to have the, uh, you know, uh, staff principals that are supportive of it. I think we're getting there, but I haven't been in that position for a while. Now, uh, my children are all grown up and they've, I've got grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So it's up to them now to do their bit uh, to get their children through, uh, uh, get schooling and a good education. My mother always said, you need to get educated. And she's right. Thank you. I, I just talk a little bit about me. I'm, I'm a cultural educator and I've been involved for um, well, the last 30, 40 years sort of learning, learning about my culture and, uh, and it was a, a slow process uh, and I've had elders around me uh, that encouraged me to, do, to get involved and, uh, and I was a little bit hesitant sort of getting, getting involved with the culture uh, and it's up until my sister, she was a principal at uh, Ghana Plain School, and she was the impetus to say, "Come on, get involved with the language, you know, you, and learn learn more about your culture." Uh, so having those sort of role models, elders around at that time, was very uh, supporting in trying to, uh, you know, really find your way and find your culture. And uh, and now I've had the opportunity. To uh, to uh, you know, pass on that knowledge that I've that I've learnt, and and like all the all the people when I go take cultural tours, and they say to me, oh, you know, we weren't we weren't taught taught about Aboriginal people, uh, you know, they they didn't teach us that in, in schools, and uh, and and at the end of it, the, they have tears in their eyes, and and uh, you know, seeing that sort of that response from people that. Uh, you know, I think, well, that should have happened early in my school years. So I think education is the key, and, uh, and the more you learn about, uh, you know, other people's cultures and Aboriginal cultures, it makes, a, uh, you know, life and the community a, a lot better. So, uh, you know, having that uh, awareness, and, and I think we should have our elders at, uh, at those schools. So I go to schools and... Uh, and impart my, my cultural knowledge and, and you know, the appreciation I get from the teachers and the parents are, are just uh, overwhelming. So, uh, so that's why I enjoy doing these sort of things and, and being involved with the community is a, is a big part of it. So, uh, and being on this committee has, has taught me a lot too. Um, my name is uh, Lynette Crocker, <coughs> and I suppose I've been involved in um, education uh, for a long, long time. Um, when I first got married, I moved to Victoria, and um, I was employed as a, an Aboriginal education worker, otherwise known as a teacher aide, in a technical school in a library. So um, I got to deal with all the naughty kids that came to the library that the teachers um, couldn't control in the classroom. 
But I soon worked out that those kids were the little smarties that came to the library, and of course they showed showed them how to use the library, and they learnt uh, more on a one-to-one -one basis <laughs> in the library than what they did in the, in this classroom. But uh, after we worked out the little game that was playing, uh, the we or, you know they put a stop to it, but. Uh, that was uh, interesting, but it was, we had a major population of uh, Aboriginal students, and of course it was also, um, uh, there was lots of uh, other nationalities that went to that school as well, so it was multi, uh, you know, cultural. Um, and we had a wonderful week one year uh, when we had, um, people from Mornington Island come down and visit the school. And they lived in the school and um, for the whole week or going home with the, billeted with the other teachers. And um, what they did was they taught everybody in the school um, about um, cultural awareness, about, um, you know, maths, and science and art and culture and dance for the whole week. And uh, it was uh, one of those uh, really good weeks in education that the children responded to and they learnt all about it. And, uh, and it was uh, an exchange and it was a real reciprocity. And um, the students that, uh, the Aboriginal students that met the people from Mornington Island were uh, very enthused about wanting to teach and, or have asked the teachers to, could they have uh, local culture taught in the, in the school. And uh, so that's where that started and after that I was, I got a job in Canberra, and it was around Aboriginal education, which um, uh, every state and territory had um, had people working on it. And I worked with uh, within the Commonwealth government for education. So within that, there was the development of an Aboriginal education policy for. Um, you know, education across from early childhood to higher education and to the independent schools uh, that were around along with the Catholic and uh, other denominations of church schools. And um, across that, the states and territories had, um, had their, a funding regime and um, Within that funding regime, the Commonwealth acted as a supplementary assistant. Now, I don't know if the, the, uh, the education policy, because it went for about three trienniums, and then I came back to South Australia, and um, where I got um, a real education about uh, my own culture and heritage and, uh, and I learnt about the loss of land, the loss of culture, the loss of um, language, and the loss of uh, quite a lot of things for our people. And, uh, and I suppose I learnt about the history of this state and how it is in denial of Aboriginal rights. And, um, and I'm still learning about that and hoping to push the truth telling uh, that people could understand what really happened here. Because it's um, after the big experiment where we were taken off the point of colonization where we were taken off country, moved to Penindi, all mixed up, all moved from mission stations here, there and everywhere and mixed up. It's only now, five generations later, where people are coming back, knowing who they are, where they can stand, 
and what part of the country do they actually come from. So in having said all that, it's a big uh, process that uh, needs to happen and we can't do it alone. We have to seek a collective impact so that we can have people all doing something to start squaring the ledger and making everything right. And I mean right for everybody. So I think that is the only way to do that is with education and it's with shared responsibility and shared obligations. And I know we can do it and I was always proud of South Australia when we had the Curriculum Council. But where's that gone? Like everything's gone into somewhere else, another realm somewhere. But some of the things that did work, we should hang on to, but then look at, you know, it's a chance now for us to reset and to think about this thing. Uh, you know, people talk about the virus and everything, but it's time, it's time for us to think within this and think about things, how we can flip the coin and, um, and have a, a better world for everybody around our own family and well-being that uh, is about educating the community and educating one another about ourselves and some of the good things that we have. So I think I've said enough. I'm the naughty boy that uh, they put in there, the police took away and put in the boys' homes and all that. And once they took me away from my mother and everything, I had nine other brothers and sisters. Once they took me away, that was it. I never returned home. I was, what, 11, 10 or 11 years old. I never came back till I was 18 years old, 19. I think 20 was the, was the cut-off point for me. And they... Um, I was put through all different homes, different. I went to the reformatory. I spent another four or five years in there. I was already criminalized because the situation like that in those places, you become criminalized. Everything sounds exciting, everything sounds good, and you learn all these stuff. And after I got, got away from there, I, I returned home to the mission. My grandfather was still alive. David Unipen had passed away. I'd been home on previous occasions uh, to visit, and the old man was getting pretty crook then. Old David Unipen was starting to get very sick. Uh, um, he used to shuffle along the years in terrible pain and I could see that he would die soon anyway and I'd go back to the reformatory and they would, it would start again this, this stupid life. Um, there was no more education for me. They, con they considered me too old. You know, I was 18 or 19 at that time so I got out of there and uh, I made a life for myself. Um, I uh, went back to the mission and spoke to my grandfather and he said, boy, have we got a, we got a massive job here to uh, fix all of this stuff that you, you know, all the experience you've had, you know. So uh, he, um, he said about using psychology on me. Telford Unipen, my grandfather, was a brilliant man. I, I've never met any man since in my life who was more brilliant than he was. He's a full-blooded Aboriginal. He's a great guy. And Telford began playing with my mind. He was sitting with a talk. He said, you're even old enough to have a drink which I'd have a few with him. He loved it. He used to really get, uh, he'd really get going. He'd really get full as a boot. 
but everything he ever said to me came true. He told me who I'd marry, not the name of the person, but where I'd go, how I'd go about it, what I would do throughout my life. And he was spot on. He said, your friends will be all these type of people, like professors and lawyers and doctors and all this kind of stuff. And I, thought, I thought, oh, he's mad, you know. Why do I want to listen to this, you know? But at 40 years old, I got married to a girl from overseas. And I've been married uh, twice more. My kids are grown up. I'm a, I've got eight great-grandchildren and more to come. And uh, well, your life is what you make it. You can be anything. And my grandfather said that to me right throughout the time he was alive. He died in 1977. So it was very hard to me uh, on my own, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I remembered everything he ever said. And I went through life like that. I had a bit of luck during my life, but other than that, Anyone can do anything. And I thought, oh, I didn't get educated, so I went and bought a, a set of uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, and I read it from A to Z. And I said, you want to ask me a question, man, if you want to? <laughs> and that was that. And my life is, is great. And I'm lucky to be healthy, and if it wasn't for those, those old people, I'll be well and truly gone. Because all those kids that were in the home with me are all passed away. A long time ago too. Hmm. So that's all I've got to say. Yeah. Education is a very powerful tool. But my experience of education is that it's a tool used by systems, not by the individuals that are in it. And to recall, and I'm probably misusing her words, but Peggy McIntosh talks about the fact that she was taught to see acts of meanness through those behaviours of individuals and not through the eyes of looking at a whole system. And I've worked with many educators. Uh, I was part of the Hughes Committee back in, if you can remember that, back in the 1980s uh, when Emeritus Professor Hughes looked at the national scene in terms of education both at a schooling sector as well as the vet sector and also uh, university sector. And one of the things that always sticks in my mind about what Paul said, and he said it at the AU at a conference that we held, he said, it's not a question of thinking up new ideas or new concepts of how we might advance the needs of Aboriginal children and young people. It's actually the fact that we've lacked the intestinal fortitude to maintain a level of continuity about what we put in place. And that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is the endless changes, and I was a bureaucrat for you know quite a few years, and I'm probably guilty of some of that myself, but we tend to cut and change without necessarily looking at the consequences what happens to people at the end of the chain. And for me, uh, being a head of school in TAFE for a number of years, um, running the School of Aboriginal Education, which is now a little boutique hotel um, in Wakefield Street, one of the things there was we picked up a lot of kids who were looking for a second, maybe a third chance. And we don't really allow for second and third chances. 
I got humiliated in the education department for suggesting that these kids who are failing to achieve their true potential uh, should never be suspended from school. Suspension is a form of criminal act on the part of education systems. It is unwieldy, unnecessary and draconian. And Aboriginal kids are at the end of that. Uh, we did some work in the western suburbs, in the southern suburbs and the northern suburbs and we found horrendous social dysfunction in some of these kids' lives. But what were we doing in the education department? We were suspending them. Suspending them to what? And unfortunately, that behaviour is maintained to this day. And I'm very passionate about those years that I had in the TAFE as well as the education department. We were fortunate to have an AEU at that time which was um, very pro-Aboriginal people and had some very strong advocates in that organisation. So when we were getting kicked, we could actually drop back and get some support from them and their members. But Aboriginal people need you. You own the system. We don't own the system. You own it. And you're responsible through your votes and your management of the system to bring about change. Inclusion is not our responsibility. It's a responsibility that lies with the people that own the system. And for me, these seminars, such as this one, are terribly important. My mother was a member of the Stolen Generation. She had the view that you never look back, you go forward. Never look back, go forward. Charles Perkins once said, you can live in the past, you, you can remember the past, but you cannot live in the past. And we don't want to recycle the past in our journey together. And Aboriginal kids today deserve the best education possible. If kids aren't coming to school, get someone to go and pick them up. When I ran the school in TAFE, we'd go and pick the apprentices up. Our lecturers were threatened to chuck buckets of water over them if they didn't get out of bed. I mean, you wouldn't do that now. You might get into serious trouble. But it was the motivating factor, and I know there are educators here that I know who are very passionate about putting the best effort into those children and young people that they can possibly give. It is not the educator. It is not the educator, it's the system that needs to take some responsibility. Thank you. As a scientist, as a social scientist who's Indigenous or Narunga or Ngarangiri or Gauna, there's a couple of sort of um, provocations that has concerned me and consumed my 30 years of academic scholarship. And the first one is, um, what's the place of the child in our society? And what I think Australia needs to ask this question of itself. Uh, I think the elders is, are wanting to know from Australia what's the place of the Aboriginal child in society at the moment. And um, this question is really a conundrum because uh, all the Aboriginal children in prison in the Northern Territory, all, all, all children in, in prison in Northern Territory are Aboriginal, every single one of them. And the way in which Australia is um, incarcerating children in detention centres um, across the Pacific, something's not right. So 
The key question I think the elders are asking is what is the place of the child in our society? And if the Dondale Detention Centre where young Dylan Vollen, Volla could be strapped to an Abu Ghraib type of chair with a mask on in the Northern Territory and that the Australian government overrides the Racial Discrimination Act to implement the intervention in Northern Territory only six years ago, there's something seriously wrong. And as a scholar, the question, if we ask, what's the place of the child in our society, we have to explain how inequality works in Australia. And as David has said, we have to explain it to the system itself. So with this question of how does inequality work um, and what is the place of the child in our society, uh, we know that when democracy, or John Dewey teaches us, when democracy is thin, we as the defender of the child's right loses. The child is the last to get the vaccine. The child is the first to get removed from school. So 280 million children in 2018 in the United Nations report weren't attending school around the world. Around about um, in 2020, when the, 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 um, the virus first hit, there were around about 1.6 million, according to the World Economic Forum, 1.6 million children around the world out of school. And then um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students are only roughly around 278,000. So really, the government should really know them by name, they're that small. They're such a small cohort, and yet it has the highest youth suicide rates in the world, the literacy, poorest literacy rates in the country, around about 30%, the highest rates of child incarceration, appalling failures of schooling and Australia is still not living up to the promise of democracy. And so when a child doesn't get their rights, it's not the problem of the child. It's a problem of democracy. And if schools do the work of the nation, and the, the principal and the teachers do the work of the nation, and there are two brilliant schools and brilliant principals in this room with you tonight that upheld the rights of the child and believe that all child, children were intelligent. Meredith Edwards is here from Woodville High, past uh, retiring principal. And we know Andrew Plasto is here from um, Alberton that has lots of Aboriginal children. And both of those principals believe that all children were intelligent and that the schools do the work of the nation, and that they saw our children as competent subjects. They saw that their cultural and linguistic intelligences that they brought from home when linked to the curriculum works. So we know what works. The question then is, how does the nation ensure that the child rights is upheld, which Professor Watson outlined. Professor Watson's question is a, is a powerful one. How do we tell the truth? Well, if a nation's brutal histories of dispossession of indigenous peoples, these brutal histories of our country, what does it mean to educate all children on Aboriginal land? What's the purpose of schooling 
after the stolen generation. I think my elders are saying on here that we have lots of work to do in explaining what is the purpose of the child in our society. Are we seeing the child as our future? Or is the child our enemy? Now, Plato, when he was writing about uh, in the early Greek philosophy, he was telling Socrates, his, um, his uh, mentor, that these children just don't sit still. If only children could sit still, they would get somewhere. And he almost diminishes the child as a competent subject. But if our child is our future rather than our problem, then we must constantly ask, what does it take and do we have what it takes to eradicate school failure for Aboriginal children? And I think if we ask these notions that Professor Watson, and this is my last point, of how we tell the truth, then surely we have had teaching practices and processes that have taught amnesia in the past. And I think my elders on the stage are suggesting that current teaching practices of amnesia are not fit for purpose for a maturing country. They have no place amongst us, yet they exist. So the, the conundrum that Professor Watson has left you today is how do we fix this to move towards truth telling? And then my final point. We are in a current, I want to talk to the historical moment. We are in a current historical moment that none of us have ever been in before. We are wondering whether if this generation of children can save the planet. It's how serious it is. There is no planet B. This is it. And you only get, if the science is right, the next two generations. The question, if we've never been here before, and we as the defender of the child in this room struggle when democracy is thin and we've got a changing planet that is threatening our existence. What is the place of the child in this country? Thank you. Um, does anyone want to pick up on... We've all had our turn. Does anyone want to pick up and comment further? Thank you, everyone. Um, it's... Uh, it, it's uh, a lot... Um, We've travelled over many light years of time in thinking about Aboriginal education and the challenge is, is um, I guess, the, the shifting, shifting the paradigm in the way we think about education from a mainstream context to seeing how generous we can be in this country to grow it up further and understand what a two-way approach might be. Because for us as First Nations peoples, we live in two worlds. We, 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 we are the survivors of, of colonisation and ongoing colonisation, so we live in the world of the colonial. We all do, non-Aboriginal people as well. We're, we're all in this colonial project and we've all been colonised only it impacts First Nations in, in a way that is particular and different. But bringing forward and knowing that we, we, our ways of being are ancient and, um, 
And if we dispel the myth of terra nullius and understand that these historic myths were used as a tool to dispossess us from all things of, and ways of our being, from our life and our lands, and in particular our, our um, way of being and educating our communities, how, how might we think about two-way education? How might we be more generous in our understanding of what that means? Do we even want to think about it? These are some of the critical questions that um, we put before you. But I don't want to take up all the space, David. I think we need to acknowledge that when we're talking about two-way education, that there are a lot of people out there doing it. Mm. And there are a lot of Aboriginal people who are engaged in providing two-way education. Frank does a lot, and there's lots of other people. So I think we need to acknowledge that there are Aboriginal people there in schools, but it's not a, as I was saying earlier, it's not a system-generated support. It's actually on the heads of individual principals and their staff to generate that type of uh, response. And I think we need uh, some clearer support for the teaching of Aboriginal curriculum and enabling Aboriginal kids to discover their own languages. It's a difficult one because in many schools there are mixed groups of children who come from different cultural backgrounds. And those kids, um, I don't believe, I said this to my grandchildren at, uh, when they were at Parafield, um, they said, oh, we're going to say the welcome to country in Ghana. I said, no, you're not going to do it. It's not your language. You can acknowledge the uh, Ghana people, but it's not your language. If you're going to do a welcome, oh, but the Cambodian kids and the Vietnamese kids are going to do it. So we'll, we will do it in your language, not in the language uh, of the Ghana people, because that shows some level of disrespect. I'm just saying that there are people out there doing it. How do you make that a system-wide change? And the other one is about how do we bring Aboriginal context into a school that recognises that there's already a skill and a knowledge base in our community. I want you to leave here today and never... Someone's going to sing that song in a minute. Um, <laughs> Never, ever use the word capacity building again when you refer to Aboriginal people, because you need it when it relates to us. So we've got a mutual problem. So let's not use that and let's say, what do I give to you and what do you give back to me? Because already there's a level of knowledge and skill within the Aboriginal community that can be tapped into. The other part of it is to get more of the work, Aboriginal workforce back on the street talking to our families. Where they are, not where you think they should be. And uh, I think we're not doing enough of that. We're, we're locking our Aboriginal workers up into offices and schools. And they need to get out amongst our community. Give them a petrol voucher or something so they can go and actually visit families in their home. That's where Lewis started. And it's still relevant today. But it gets back to Paul Hughes's point. We stopped doing it. Why? It was working. Why didn't we keep doing it? And it's very important to look at those matters from a, a cultural and community perspective. Because we've got a new narrative, and the new narrative is Aboriginal families. We're a long way, many of us, from our traditional country, so we're encased in our own family structures. What do they look like? How do they work? Who fits where? And who fits with whom? That, for me, is the question that you need to consider very closely, because that family structure brings about engagement. It's not necessarily the dynamic of the cultural group, I, I live a long way from where I come from, but my family is very central to what I'm doing, and my friends who are Ghana and Narunga and Nuttingery uh, are around me as well. So I think we've got a different dynamic, a different narrative that we've got to consider.
I was just thinking earlier we, in our discussions before we come here, this notion of um, shifting the goalposts, if anyone wants to comment on that. I know we talked about it, um, well, it's something that you've talked about a lot, Uncle Lewis, about we, we um, and, and I'm particularly interested in, in thinking about some of the current changes that we're managing in terms of um, education for our young people in the schools and, and the shifts that are occurring. Would anyone like, like to comment about this notion of shifting the goalpost and how that impacts on us, particularly in some of the conversation we've had that um, what we're presenting here is, 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 is a, long, a long view back, you know, from, um, you know, Uncle, Uncle Lewis brings decades of experience in Aboriginal education and this notion that, and particularly for someone like Uncle Lewis and, and Rosalind and Lynette, all of us really, have, have seen these changes and have, have come up with um, resolutions and solutions that have worked. Yeah. But why then, as Lester has, um, has indicated, the current statistics and the current critical climate, and also what we're facing, you mentioned in terms of two generations of, of, of future children in the current sort of trajectory of, of the environmental crisis of what we're facing. We could look at it that way. Um, no one knows for sure, but we could look at that, it that way. Why, what is this thing about shifting goalposts and why is it so hard to, we make the change and we have been highly successful all of this panel have been highly successful in all of the work that they've done, but why does it remain so difficult? Can I just uh, make an observation, is that young people today, just, you know, mobile phones, laptops, computers, uh, they listen to the music all night long. Um, it, they're on social media. And I see it with my own grandchildren when they were all going to high school. And I'm thinking, how can they learn if their mind is now being um, listening to all of that and watching all those uh, on YouTube and Facebook and all that social media. And they immediately pick up the phone like I did, but I couldn't turn it off. I had to get Lester to do it. They immediately pick up the phone and they answer it. I'm thinking it's not an emergency call. Sometimes we could be just sitting down having a meal. Turn the phones off. It's like it's hard for them to do. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only one who has, who has grandchildren or great-grandchildren that has that problem. Uh, do you, anyone else from the audience, from the panel, do you see that as a problem? Why the learning isn't happening because they're too busy with that phone in their hand. That's just one of the social environmental impacts that has on the child, learning on the child at home, at, with the child listening to mum and dad and nana and papa and uncles and aunties, mm. how we were brought up. We had to listen, but now they're waiting for this phone to ring because they can get everything on that phone. They can get schooling. They can get um, Google, Google anything. So is that one of the, the social barriers now that we've created for the child? Why well, that child will say, well, I, can, I don't have to attend the lecture. I don't have to attend the tute. I can get it on here. So are we thinking that technology is now taking over the cultural and the responsibility of the parents, the school? That bar, that was barring the, the, the mobile phones in the high school where my granddaughters went, and I'm thinking, great. That's what should have happened from the very beginning. So I bar them from when they walk in, put your mobile phone over there. You come to visit me? Well, I don't see them that often, because <laughs> they always want to be answering the phone. There's a real need for them to answer that phone. That's just one of the things that have impacted on everybody's learning ability in any type of level of schooling, primary, high school, university even. 
Anyway, that was just an observation. Yeah. <laughs> I'd also like to say something else. <laughs> Is I was really happy to show that video and Lester was dancing in it. And that was, what, 30 years ago? Or something mm. like that, at Woodville High School. And that was through uh, the NAIDOC type celebrations that we were having in the other school. Um, but there was such an important part to play uh, for the coming together of the Aboriginal students, parents, and the outer, the other community members, the other the staff, the parents, because it created a good relationship, not just on the day, but after that day. And I'm sure, Lester, I really would like you to say something about that video, because you were the star. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Auntie. <laughs> uh, Woodville High School has a long history of um, recognising diversity and uh, continue, has continued that for a long time. Uh, there were 30 children who moved in from the mission as I did. Um, you heard Uncle Frank talk about his time, he's my uncle, and uh, we moved in from the mission. Uh, so I, I was pretty much... Um, uh, it was before the Racial Discrimination Act. It's just on the. It was still owned. Um, I had the right to vote, but wasn't encouraged to. Uh, so, it, as a, as a young child, it was. Uncle Frank's right. It's about institutionalising. There were 30 children that enrolled at Woodville that year, from missions around the around the country, and so I was one of them. And one of the interesting things that uh, when we were spoken to by some of the powerful non-Indigenous teachers there who believed in us, who said, you know, you are all intelligent and your culture belongs. And one of the things that had happened was we were copying lots of racism outside of the school and to a lesser extent inside the school. And so the school wanted to show everyone in the state that it was serious about you know, bringing the funds of knowledge that the child has brought, that I brought, into school and all the other Aboriginal kids. So we went on the, the f most famous children's TV at that stage. And so um, we, the dance that you saw was from Japanunka uh, from Walbury. Um, it was uh, crossed over with a Gauna um, a dancing called the Kuri dance, which is a famous Gauna dance. And um, it was sung by Japanunka, who's passed. Um, but nonetheless, here we were exhibiting our intellectual and cultural strengths. And uh, so I had this capital, this capital of cultural strengths, like you saw me dancing. And I could speak it in my language, but when I went to cash it in, when I went to cash this cultural capital, sometimes t the teacher was only buying English only. And so success was defined as me being an expert in settler grammar. And yet, I could speak my language, I could tell you an 80,000 year old dance called the Kuri dance and the Palti dance, which you saw. And so that was, that was worthless. But at Woodville High School, it was worth something. And that made me feel belong. And so I, um, I hadn't seen that for such a long time. Thank you. Shame. <laughs> um, because, you know, I don't think I... Uh, I, I was too skinny then, I think. <laughs> but, yeah, but thank you, Aunt. That's um, a real... I, I, but, I, but I just wanted to say that I think that the central thing that um, David and all the elders and, and Professor Watson is saying, I think if, if I can give you a tip and for the educators in the audience and the parents, is that your child is full of wonder and strength. And that your child has all of these experiences and knowledges. And I think that if you're a teacher, the, the, the number one thing you can do, I'm, I'm a theorist in culturally responsive schooling. 
And um, I think the, the central thing of my theory is validate who they are, their identity. Validate what they bring to school. <coughs> Affirm what they bring. Build on what they bring. And bridge what they bring to global knowledges. So validate, affirm, build and bridge. Validate, affirm, build and bridge. And the science is true, the science works, culturally responsive pedagogies work. And we know that when a child is validated for who they are and what they're bringing to school, and it's linked to the curriculum, we know that the child feels belonging. Thank you. I think on that note, um, we'll close the, the forum and thank you all for, for supporting us tonight and look forward to, um, to all the future work that lay ahead for us all. Thank you.